What's up, guys? This is episode 56 of Hoops Talk with Dave's Joint. Shout outs to everybody that's been supporting the wave so far. Um, for those who haven't seen any of my episodes yet, go check it out on YouTube, Facebook, and IGTV. But without further ado, I have a very special guest right here. He's a product of Brooklyn. Played at Robeson High for the legendary Larry Majors. Went to Hofstra University and also did, had a stint um, in the NBA with the Seattle Sonics. And he, now he's a personal trainer. Without further ado, I give you Mr. Kenny Adelike. Did I say it right? Yeah, you said it right. But um, right. I like to clear that up. I like calling it player development because one thing I, I am is a coach, but I'm just trying to carry on tradition. More so um, in the 90s and uh, early 2000s, uh, whether it was college or high school, with um, the great Larry Major, like you stated, he was our head coach, but he ran our workouts and stuff like that. So um, I noticed um, they like to have a lot of separation between uh, play development and coaching, but I think you can mix both of them together in the sense of, you know, you can, you can get the kids uh, better with, you know, teaching them how to play the right way as a coach, but at the same time, working on their skills and just, you know, especially with my past experience, man, it would be, um, it, it, it wouldn't be um, uh, right to just look at it, just be like, okay, let me coach, because it's so much stuff, especially that age, uh, when they're in high school, you can, you know, you can uh, fix up and, you know, you can, um, you know, help teach them, because that's when they're learning, that's, um, you know, when they're getting to the next level before college. Indeed. So, my first question is for you, Kenny. Um, when did um, basketball begin for you? Basketball began for me, um, I'll say around, um, I'll say 12, 13. It was just something I did in the sense of, um, I, I did a little bit of everything. Um, I played football, um, um, you know, I boxed a little. And I was just trying to find my way, just, you know, being active as a kid. So um, I believe in eighth grade, I got um, really good. And when I got um, good, uh, you know, Major started recruiting me. And uh, after he started recruiting me, um, it was history from them because, you know, I, I came in, I was, you know, very raw, but in the end of the day, I had a, I had a great worth ethic. I had an appetite to, to um, really take my game to the next level. So you were originally born in Lagos, Nigeria. When did you first come to the States? I came when I was uh, seven years old. I came, I believe, in like the second grade. So um, you know how it is with the foreigners. This is New York City. Whether you're an island boy or you know you're you know you um, African, you know, for 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 me and my family, we we moved in with uh, you know my aunt, my uncles, and you know got like you know cousin to everything like in a year or two. Then you know finally get be able to get our own spot and stuff. You know. Mm, that's what's up. Talk about the Nigerian culture. Well, with Nigerian culture, the, the, the main thing is hard work in the sense of, you know, if you're not where you want to be, you know, you better be working 10 jobs and, you know, you better, you know, be first one up, and last one sleeping. And, um, you know, education is a big thing with, um, you know, Nigerian culture in the sense of, you know, it's like, you know, I, I had a chance to go back when I was 29. Um, then I was going to, you know, play for the national team over there and then we had a break. Uh, when I was playing in Ukraine uh, overseas and I went there for like a week and when I went there you know a lot of parts you know in, in, in the city that we think is rough the, the Brooklyn the Bronx it was nothing over compared to like when I was over there there were times where I would go certain places I didn't want to come out the car because I wasn't accustomed I wasn't you know used to the to the you know lifestyle you know just in the sense of you know how um you know freelance how wild it could be you know in the sense of it's, it's very you know, some parts, don't get me wrong, you know, we have a lot of, um, obviously, history. We have a lot of resources. But if you go to a lot of the, in, those inner cities in Nigeria, man, they're, 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 you can't even say poor. They're, it's just, you know, it's just a different, like, you know, different trials over there. So, um, you know, that's why a lot of us, when we come over here, we're so big on education in the sense of you look at it as an opportunity of a lifetime. And just like, man, like, what? Like, you know, you got water to run. You know, you... um. You know, you don't got to wear the same things every day. So a lot of Nigerians take advantage of that. It's just like, yo, listen, I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to do things the right way and just, you know, uh, get my education on and, and, and see what I could become, you know? Indeed, man. So um, what what part of Brooklyn were you raised in? 
Um, for the most part, I, I, I grew up around different um, parts of the city, but um, I'll say um, Crown Heights, best I, um, my mother, my father, they, they split probably, I say in um, high school and, and my father was, uh, he started off in Best Eye and then, you know, migrated over like uh, Crown Heights, uh, Pacific and Kingston. And, um, you know, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time obviously with both of them, but, you know, for the most part, you know, was, you want to be close to school. And, you know, I went to, um, you know, Robeson in Crown Heights. So, um, you know, that's, 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 that's what I jack, like the young boy say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, when did, um, so you said you started basketball at 12, but before yeah. we get into that, like, talk about the basketball culture in Brooklyn. Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal, man. You got guys like Stephon Marbury, Jamal Tinsley, when um, I'm bringing it back in the sense of guys when I was old, I'm like, man, like, you know what, I want to take it to that level where they're at, you know. And, um, you know, when I was coming out around that time, my high school alone, uh, our team, we were number 17 in the country that time. I played with uh, Gary Irvin, uh, the Nazareth um, the Nazareth high school coach. And, um, you know, me and Gary kind of had like a similar kind of um, uh, story in the sense of we were nobodies until our junior year because, you know, going to Robeson and we had guys like Shamel Jones who played in Memphis, Alan Griffin who played at Syracuse, who's a Syracuse coach now. Todd Miles, who went here, and Todd was the first one. Todd and Jamil Watkins. Todd played at Mississippi State, and Jamil went to Georgetown. And, and the list goes on and on. I can't name all these guys. But, you know, just growing up and, you know, looking up to those guys and stuff like that, you know, we are, you know, Major used to always say, you know, your junior year is the most important year. So I believe my sophomore year, I was averaging like four points a game or something like that. And I just took it to the next level. And, um, I averaged uh, 19 or 13. And the same thing with Gary, too. I, you know, Gary came out of nowhere. Gary was actually not even eligible. He played his freshman year. He gave us good minutes in that sophomore year. He was ineligible. And in his junior year, he just he took over the city. You know, like, he, he came through like like Willie Beeman and he gave us Sunday. Nobody knew about him. But every big game we had, uh, you know, Grady at the time, the Lincolns, he had big games, you know, 25, 30 balls and stuff like that. So... I was real proud of him because I always looked like looked at him like a little brother. And you know, when all when when all the college coaches would ask me who's next, I'll be like him and um another guy I was cool with in the Bronx, Alan Ray and stuff like that. So I felt them two was gonna be like, you know, the uh when I, you know, left my senior year that they were gonna be like the face of New York City. That's what's up. So as a youth, like what tournaments did you like playing in? Um I like we had citywide back in the day. I like citywide. Um, I believe uh, in Lower East Side, Alfred E. Smith Homes. They had like a tournament over there. And the you know, forget it. Like you know, as far as like our uh, Kingston Park. Don't get me wrong. Like the local tournaments, you know. But you know, um, Kenny Anderson in Queens. But I was one of those kids. I played in every borough. Like any coach, anywhere I got to hook up to play, I did. And um, I played in, you know, UDC in the Bronx. And um, I can't remember the tournament. Um, uh, and I, I think I played against Allen there the first time. Uh, damn, I, I can't even think of the name. But it was so many tournaments back in the day. But to me, citywide stands out the most because if you win it for your borough, it's kind of like New York, New York, how the setup is now. Right. You know, like a tournament. I know a lot of people don't know about it right now. But um, that, was, um, that was something that probably, like, you know, you know, comes off and, um, and oh, most of, and ISA, can't forget about ISA. Mm -hmm. ISA, I, I feel like that really put me on the map in high school in New York City. But, you know, that's that's where, like, you know, a lot of things happen for me in the sense of just, um, you know, get my name out there. Now, where did you play AAU at um during your high school years? During high school years, um, New York Panthers, uh, they call it, I believe, the Long Island Panthers, too. I played with the Panthers and um, Gary Charles, and we had a – if we, like, I remember even back then, the internet was kind of, you know, starting to really pop off. And uh, the funny thing is, um, it was a star lineup for Jason Frazier. He's a McDonald's All-American. Uh, Lenny Cook, who I believe he didn't qualify because he was a fifth year, but he was, like, number one in the country. Me and Curtis something. A lot of people forgot about Curtis something, but at Villanova, he averaged 15 a game, and I think if he didn't hurt his knee, he would have been an NBA draft pick. You know, you're averaging 15 a game for Villanova in the Big East. That's that's no joke. 
So uh, Kurt was about six seven. Lenny was about six seven. Jay was about six nine, six ten. I was like six eight. And whoever you know, and more than likely it would be you know we had different point guards. So we had our guy Eric Ferguson from um, uh, he played at the University of Arkansas. So he just throw us out five out there. And they said I remember reading an article and it said their front court uh, could play against UCLA right now. So you know we wow. definitely had a squad. You know back in the day. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, what was it like? Oh, what was like, you know, the trips like with the Panthers and also like the the um the overall competition? Back then the competition was crazy. I, I remember um I think it was a few days ago, um, I think um uh who's um Quinn Richardson had an interview, him and Darius Miles, and they were talking about how it was back in the day. So, you know, back in the day, if you were number one and number two in the country you had to play against each other like that uh, ABCD camp um, that I was a participant of, um, you know, back then, like the best had to play the best. And I guess I believe Kwame Brown and uh, Eddie Curry were the top two guys. They played against each other um, in the all-star game. Um, and I played in that game too, but they played against each other, like in like the, you know, the, the matchups in the sense of just like um, the, you know, the, the pool play and stuff. So back then you couldn't you couldn't duck anybody you know and um AAU you know there were other teams like the DC Assaults um I, I believe Michigan Mustangs um there were Adidas too and there were so many good teams and we would play against each other like three four times and now I know AAU you know you'll be lucky if these two top teams play against each other once you know so because it's so big and like they give everybody chances to um you know, I guess do what they do and play against each other. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. So um, let's talk about – let's go straight to the Robeson year. So your junior year was a big year. That was 99-2000, correct? Yeah, yeah. I graduated 2001. So um, that was my junior year, and that was, that was definitely a big year and a year that, that changed my life. So um, from there, let's talk about your senior year. You guys made it all the way to the championship, and um, that year you – well, actually, no. Let's – before we get to the, before we get to your senior year, so you played in the 2000 ABCD camp. Talk about that experience. That experience, it was, it was, it was everything for me. Oh, oh, and no, I'm sorry. A lot of, I got to go back because I know uh, Charlie Villanueva played in our AU team too. So sometimes it would go back and forth. Charlie, Charlie definitely started all the time, so I forgot about Charlie. It would kind of be mixed up sometimes, me or just different people like we, but, but for the most part, let's just say uh, Charlie Villanueva and Lenny, they always started every game, let's put it that way. And then everybody else it was just more so like, we had so much talent. It was like 15 Division One players on one team. But that camp, I remember, um, uh, you know, you bringing that up made me think about Nate Blue. Nate mm. Blue is one of the best scouts in the country right now, and he's helped a lot of young men get to that next level, whether it's the NBA or, you know, uh, Division One college, right? So um, the funny thing is, I remember Nate telling me, because it was I, – I had a good season, but AAU was different in the sense of just, like, there was so much talent. There will be games I have, like, 20 points, and there will be games I had, like, four points, you know, because we had so much talent. And, um, you know, he would, he told me before the camp, I never forgot, he said, he said, you're going you're gonna to blow up after this, you're going to do your thing, you know. So I'm just thinking, like, yeah, whatever, you know. you know. But it was something I was ready for. Um, Major took me to ABCD in ninth grade. I got to meet Sonny Vicario, and I got to meet, like, uh, uh, she not meet, see the other, the big dogs at the time I was a freshman. I saw DeMar Johnson, Jason Capono, um, of the world, um, the, you know, so, you know, it was a chance for me to see the competition early on. And um, I did my thing that camp um, and I ended up making the all-star game. I have 14 points and 14 rebounds, all-star wow. game. And let's say it's like 15 players on each team because, you know, you got the first five second. I was the third unit because um, I was just somebody who they were surprised who made the all-star game. I remember, you know, you know, um, Gary Charles, um, you know, he he um he was one of the guys that ran the um, ABCD camp, um him and even Tiny Moore and they were both surprised how I played and uh, they were like you know you made the All Star game so it was a big surprise so I probably was a little more focused and serious than the other guys because 
I can name that Ben Gordon, Kwame Brown, Mo Williams. Um, you know, it was so many, uh, you know, big time players and stuff like that. So I showed out, I did my thing and that kind of, you know, got me on the map, you know. And then you also, um, you also played the five-star camp that year where you had yeah. a big game of, um, I think in the all-star game, you had 22 and 12. Talk about yeah. that performance. That was, it, it was, it was big for me because, um, I believe, uh, Lenny was there, Lenny Cook, Sebastian and uh, Carmelo Anthony, too. But uh, it was funny because Carmelo was good back then, but I believe it was going to his junior year, and I was going to my senior year. And, um, you know, I got cool with him. We were teammates. He was good. And I remember we talked before the game. He was just happy to get a Georgia Tech offer. But obviously his life changed forever after that. But, um, you know, I did my thing. You know, it was like, for me, I don't know what it was, but with every All-Star game I played in that, that summer, I just – you know, I had a chip in my shoulder because with a city that a lot of guys are overrated because it's New York City and, you know, we're the mecca of basketball. So don't get me wrong, we have a lot of great players, but sometimes, you know, we have every now and then kids who maybe don't earn that kind of, um, you know, earn the props, but at the end of the day, it's like he might be the next one for New York City. I was really underrated. So I just always had a chip in my shoulder and, you know, I just, you know, I went out and just said, I'm going to get every rebound and, you know, I'm going to get buckets, you know? So, yeah, talk about, you know, your senior year at Robeson. It was, it was a great year. We had four Division One players. We had uh, me, uh, Gary Irvin. We had um, Anthony Williams, who went to Morgan State, and um, Lavelle Nimitz. Lavelle had a bunch of D1 offers. I think he ended up going to Delphi because he wanted to stay close to home. Um, you know, I, we were like city kids and um, a lot of us, you know, we want to stay close to the city, but uh, we had, we had a lot of good players and we, we put on, we were 27 and one um, before the championship game. We had a game against boys and girls and they had a kid named Tommy Eddie. Tommy played at Ole Miss and Tommy was like my biggest rival. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything with him. Tommy was like six, five, mm -hmm. had NBA range back then had a handle from Albany projects and, you know, surprising, but you get a fast break. You're going, you know, you, you know, you know, even if you get a little breathing room, he's going to dunk on you. So Tommy was a bad boy. And uh, we actually, I don't even want to say we lost that game, but um, you know, Lovelace, I love her to death. We came back cause we were down 15 and um, I believe we were down one. It was like four, five seconds left. Gary got fouled and the, clock stopped we we thought the clock stopped and they just you know kept running the clock you know um and i think the ball went out of bounds after he got fouled and you know it was just like the refs ain't let us finish that game that turn that that game was in the, in the heart of best side the refs was like listen i'm trying to go home alive you know what i mean because i don't think they let any of our fans in the game and it was the whole high you know over there so they wanted to get home safe you know so We'll leave it like that. But we mm -hmm. had a good team year. We were number 17 um, in the country at USA Today uh, right before the championship game. And I remember Major asked me, he said, what were your goals your freshman year before you came? And um, I, I don't know why I couldn't remember. And then I was just telling him these different things. And then he was like, nah, you know, you said you wanted to play on the national ranked team because the team was national ranked uh, years before I came there. So I, um, he took out the article in USA Today I don't know how big it is now with the national rankings, but back then it was everything. Mm -hmm. And then we were number 17. I'm like, oh, shoot. I was, I was surprised. So, um, like, like, we had a really good team. Um, and, um, you know, that was probably one of the best memories of my life in the sense of everything we accomplished that year, you know? Yeah, man. So, that championship game, um, when you guys played great, talk about, you know, what it was like playing on that court. That, it was the everything. Garden. It was everything for me because, like, especially when you get on that court, it was really like I don't know if it was twenty thousand, but it felt like it because it was the whole New York City, it was the whole Brooklyn to play against Grady. So mm -hmm. it's the whole Coney Island and with Robeson, um, you know, the whole uh, East Brooklyn, you know, Crown Heights, Best Side, Brownville over there, and it was just a crazy atmosphere. <laughs> And uh, we beat them in the regular season um, pretty good. I believe we probably beat them by double digits. But, man, they had a great coach at the time, Jack Ringle, and they had a bunch of great players. Quincy Doobie brought us a game. We know how Quincy's career went. He played in the NBA for a few years. Woody Soufran, my 
college roommate, he balled out, didn't miss a shot, played like um, great basketball, tied good. You know, you went to Fairfield and Mike Clark. They all played, had double, and they had a kid that came off the bench too that went to uh, Louisiana Tech. That's how deep they were. So we, we, I think we were a little confident beating them in the regular season. And then they just, you know, they came with a great game plan in the sense of um, they double, triple team me down in the post. And I think they were really focused on Gary. Todd did a good job. Even though Gary had like 20 in the garden, he did a good job. But um, their game plan was, you know, like, you know, great. You know, they, they passed the ball around. They, they broke our press. And when they broke our press, they were getting buckets with it. You know, I think that was the game plan. Like, yo, we're going to do it and get two more fast breaks. And during the whole season, nobody broke our press, you know. So um, it was just, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, you got to give your, you know, you got to tip your hat off and, you know, they were a better team that day, you know. Mm. So what was your recruitment looking like at that time? My, my recruitment was, um, it, it was, you know, definitely um, for me, I was, I was, I was happy. I was blessed because that's one thing we all wanted to get uh, scholarships. And um, I actually signed to DePaul University at the time. We had the number one recruiting class. We had me, Eddie Curry. We had like the number one Juco player in the country and, and a bunch of other good Midwest kids and stuff like that. But um, I think um, even talking back um, before, it was like not wanting to leave New York and just kind of that being the only thing I know, know at the time and, you know, with being around your family and, you know, um, so I ended up um, re reverting that and, you know, going to Hobster and stuff like that. So, you know, um, that it was a great experience over there, but I had my visits were uh, Boston College, USC, DePaul, New Mexico, they were doing their thing at the time. They had uh, Coach Fischilla, um, who was coaching St. John's. I, I believe he worked for ESPN now. So, um, you know, that and Hofstra, those were my um, those were my visits, you know? Yeah. So, um, what made you decide on Hofstra? Uh, Jay Wright and Tom Pacora. I ended up playing for Coach Tom Pacora, but Jay Wright at the time was a Hofstra coach. And um, you can ask, you know, I, I know um, I watched my my brother, Malcolm Grant. He's another Robeson alumni kid. But um, he, um, if you talk to um, Malcolm, he played for Coach Wright. And that's probably, I'm sure he still is because they win a championship. But his recruit, he's he's probably the best recruit in the country. Like, in a sense of, you know, he's, he's obviously a great coach. Um, he can relate to the players. He knows how to you know, talk to the players. And, you know, for me, I fell in love with, you know, Coach Wright and Coach Pecora. They were like the perfect one-two um, punch. They would come through the games with Amani suits, their hair slicked back. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, they were, um, you know, they were great recruiters and, um, you know, good dudes, you know, dudes that I looked at like, you know, you don't know it subconsciously, especially you've seen them all the time. We had a kid, Danny Walker, from Brooklyn too. Um, you know, he um, he's a Robes alumni. He went to Hofstra, so we, I would go to all his games all the time. So I fell in love with um, – it, it's a beautiful campus and it's a beautiful school. Um, so I fell in love with that idea and, I, you know, just to, you know, stay close to um, to family and stuff, you know? Yeah, man. So talk about, um, the you know, your your years at Hofstra. Like, it seems like you have some, some good years. Like, and you, you gave Gonzaga 18 and 9. Um. Yeah, you seems like you you used to put up numbers. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, I, I remember um reading an old article maybe a few months ago, and um, you know, I think Coach Cora has some really like you know good things to say about me. And then you know, at the time you're young, you don't really understand, but you know, he really put me in a good position. You know, he called plays for me. You know, he, um, you know, he believed in me. And then my freshman year, I had a really big game. I had like 20 and nine against um, Syracuse. And, um, you know, Kent State at the time, you know, um, they were like, I think, I believe they made the Elite Eight, um, the Elite Eight. I don't think they made the Final Four, but Elite Eight. And I had like another 25 point game against them. And, um, you know, he, he caused some great plays for me. You know, he, he gave me all the confidence in the world. He was like, you know, you know, you're a young lion. And, and it was, um, you know, especially my first two years, you know, they were, you know, great years, very efficient. Um, my second year, I was one of the best rebounders in the country. And, um, you know, um, it, it was definitely um, a great experience. 
you know, things didn't finish the way I really wanted to over there. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I do have to look at those guys over there. Um, Coach Pecora, um, Jared Grasso, who's at Bryant University now, um, David Duke, who's the head coach of um, Adelphi. You know, those guys, they were young, Coach Duke and uh, Coach Grasso. They were like my bigger brothers and stuff like that. So, you know, it's definitely a lot of good memories and stuff like that when I think about it, you know. So how was it playing for Pecora? You it seemed like as I look at the at the records, like you were part of his one of his first teams over there at Hofstra. Yeah. I believe we had like a top fifty recruiting class too. Um, because we had another kid, Chris McCray, played at St. Ray's. A lot of people don't know about Chris, but uh we played in the New York Chicago game together. We played in the ABC the All Star game together. And um I believe St. Ray's with him and Julius Hodge and out of the way, they won the state championship that year. Right, Chris 2001. Was, yeah, they, and, and Chris had a lot of those big games. He had 20 in a lot of those games. So between me, Chris, uh, we had Wendell Gibson, who played in Malloy, and uh, my brother, Woody Sufron. So we had, like, a top, like, you know, we had, like, a especially all from New York City, we had uh, one of the better classes, um, I believe. And I believe some, some, I'm not sure, but we were, like, top 50. Uh, with the recruiting class and stuff like that. So, um, with that being said, um, you know, um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, what did you ask me? Um, yeah, so I, what I was saying was, how was it playing for Picard for the three years? Um, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a good experience because um, defensively, he, he made me elite defensively. Um, uh, you know, offensively, we had assistant coach Rada. He worked with me and, you know, um, you know, got me a lot of moves and stuff like that. But, you know, Coach McCord, anybody who, you know, knows play for him, he's a tough coach. And um, he, he demands a lot out of you on and off the court. So, you know, when you're a little young at that time, you don't really understand. But, you know, you know, know what I know now is kind of one of those things is like, especially, you know, being a father, you're like, okay, you know what? I want my, you know, son to have that kind of discipline. But, um, you know, um, he was he was a great dude, you know. I, I, um, he put me on the map because you know those some of those teams that I'm talking about, uh, you know St. John's, Gonzaga, Syracuse, you know he put me in a good position to have big games against them and stuff like that. And he was somebody like I looked at, um, especially when I committed and even went to the school, like you know like kind of like a father figure, you know what I mean? So you know I got a lot of love for Coach McCord, and we actually reconnected and stuff like that, you know, because you know when you're younger, obviously things didn't work out the way I wanted to, I ended up transferring uh, for my senior year, but then, you know, you just kind of, you live through experience and understand that, you know, you got to be thankful for the good, you know? What led you to transfer out of Hofstra? I really believe it was my junior year. Um, we were having a little more success because we, we had a lot of bad luck. Guys would, like, go down like flies. Like, we were getting guys hurt like three guys with three four like three starters would you know get hurt and um because our, our, our preseason condition was brutal like I know the kids don't do that now but we were doing like uh these things called seven times and like we did like maybe like 10 sets of them 200s leading up to like 20 everything time after like you know hour lifting so I think for me it made me an animal just because we would do it six in the morning and um, a lot of guys were dropping like flies. So then our junior year, we got a bunch of guards. And I think he kind of found out that was kind of the best thing in the sense of, you know, with everything, with how hard practices and conditioning was, like four out, one in. And um, we had some really good players who came in. And, you know, it wasn't kind of the same. Um, it wasn't the same as far as just, you know, productivity in the sense of just like, you know, a new offense and, you know, everything else. So, you know, things didn't end up working out. So my junior year, it was just kind of like, you know, um, a, 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 I won't say a bad situation, but because I had, still had some good games, but it wasn't like an ideal situation, especially with what I was trying to do. And, you know, um, you know, you know, you know, get one the dreaming of playing in the NBA and end up having a long overseas career and stuff like that. So, I, I believe, too, my sophomore year, a bunch of schools, like, wanted me to transfer. Like, at the time, uh, Bill Self uh, was at Illinois, when UConn was UConn, Indiana with Mike Davis. And I, I believe that kind of has something to do with it because I think um, on the coach's end, he looked at it like, man, like, you know, I really, you know, put you on the map. And, you know, 
but for me, it was like, I'm a competitor. We had like some losing seasons and, um, you know, even now it hasn't changed tremendously as far as time because like every kid wants to play on ESPN or CBS. So it was kind of like a fight because I liked everything as far as the way everything was in the sense of getting better. Um, just I felt so, super comfortable with the coaches. But at the same time, you're like, man, like, you know, what do I do in the sense of have my best interest in, you know, trying to get to that next level, try to go to the league and stuff like that. So I believe that kind of like separated our relationship a little, you know, and um, during my junior year, um, the offense wasn't kind of ideal or like, you know, just, you know, but, you know, we had a little better results. We were, uh, I think we beat George Mason that year and they went to the final four. Um, and, you know, we, we had some good wins and stuff like that. ODU, uh, back then, I don't know how big the NIT is now, but, you know, we beat them and they had a, you know, good team and um, a good NIT team. So, you know, sometimes people, you know, grow apart and it's just the nature of the game and the business, but just being a little older, a little wiser, obviously, I'm just super thankful for everything that, you know, the people at Hofstra helped me with as far as, you know, getting me uh, that attention in the sense NBA scouts looked at me as a possible second round, you know? Mm. So then you went to Hartford um, for your senior year. Yeah. Um, what made you decide to go to Hartford and what was your senior year like? I didn't, at first, I'll be honest, I didn't want to go to Hartford. I had one, I know with two years of eligibility, I had all those bigger schools, but then with one year of eligibility, and it was just uh, short notice. Uh, we had a meeting with, uh, you know, with the coaching staff, I believe right before when school started. So I knew I wasn't coming back. And um, it was more so like I had to pick a school, like, you know, last minute. And um, somebody who was helping me at that time, he was trying to help me get to Iowa State. And I was just waiting forever. They had, you know, Curtis Stinson um, over there at the time, um, a kid Blaylock from Boston. So I'm like, you know, Iowa State, like, you know, is, is, is not um, – you know, at the time, we were top 25, but, you know, Iowa State is Iowa State, you know, one of the biggest conferences in the country. They had a lot of history. I know Jamal Tinsley went there, but uh, for whatever reason, it was just, they were dragging it, you know, it was kind of, you know, taking a long time. And um, my high school coach, Larry Major, he had a really good relationship with um, Coach Harrison, Larry Harrison, and it was a blessing in guys, and I'm glad things worked out, because at first, I'm like, man, I'm not going to Hartford. I'm like, you know, it's an American East. Um, you know, they weren't one of the better teams at the time, but it was a match made in heaven because Coach Harrison is a big man god as far as coaching because even the young boy they got now, they got this big kid named uh, Oscar. Um, I think he was a freshman last year at West Virginia. He's actually associated with West Virginia now uh, between uh, me, uh, Kenya Martins of the world, Danny Fortson. He was uh, a top 10 pick at the time. He really helped me a lot as far as just took my game to another level. So. You know, um, he would always have one-on-one -on -one sessions with me with um, uh, player development, working me out, and he would kill me. Like, you know, you would do, like, a workout, and, like, you think, okay, 40 minutes, I'm done. I'm like, I killed myself. I went hard. And that's how he's used to my workouts before. And then um, he's like, you know, get water and stuff like that. Like, okay, we got a few more things. And <laughs> you're there for another 30, 40 minutes. So it was like an hour and a half of, like, hell, but, you know, you got to go through that to get to heaven. And, you know, he, he really took my game to another level. So after graduation, um, what was the – um? did you get invited to the um pre-draft camp? Yeah, yeah. Um, I ended up uh, signing with an agent, uh, Michael Whitaker, um, at the time. Um, and I, I always – I believed in him. He was based out of D.C. And, um, you know, he believed in me, and he recruited me the hardest. A lot of bigger agents kind of came later you know, more so in the end of the year. But the funny thing was, I just had a good feeling with him and a, a good gut feeling. And um, I went with him and I was like on a waiting list in Portsmouth. So I got in Portsmouth. Um, I played two out of three games. I think the last game, something happened on my shoulder. I had like a, a ball in it or something like that. Came out of nowhere. So I played two games and I had some really big games. I played with uh, J.J. Barrera at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I love this guy, man, because he – um. He just kept giving me the ball and made me look good. And I was so lucky to have him as a teammate because I think he had a game out there where he had um, the record for the most assists. 
um, in the game up over there. You know what I mean? So um, mm -hmm. I, in Portsmouth, and Portsmouth had John Stockton as far as guards, the Dennis Rodman's, Carl Malone. So I remember the end of Portsmouth, uh, the gentleman that ran it, you know, he talked to me in the end, and then he said, yeah, you were on the waiting list. Um, we didn't know, you know, you were a good player. And, uh, you know, he he was a, he, he was a you know, man's man, because he even apologized. He was like, um, I'm sorry for having you on the waiting list. I didn't know you were this good of a player. And then, you know, he talked to me a little, and he told me uh, Scotty Pippen, Dennis Rodman, Carl Malone, those guys, they went over there and they made their name over there. So I was like, you know, you hear about Portsmouth, but I'm like, you know, wow, I'm with some good company in the sense of being lucky enough to get invited to a camp and, um, you know, um, performing, you know? Mm. So what was the feeling of, you know, not being drafted like? It was hard because I went to the um, pre-draft camp, um, the uh, NBA pre-draft camp, it was in Orlando at the time, and I got MVP. So the fact that I got um, MVP of the camp um, and I had 10 workouts and I played, I'll say every single, I, play, I played to me, I believe everybody I was matched up against. You know, to me, one-on-one, -on -one, especially growing up in the city, one-on-one -on -one is everything, you know, playing one-on-one. -on -one and, um, you know, and I'll play against guards all the time. So when I played against bigs, it's not that it was easy, but it's like, this is what I do. And I think I might have lost one game one-on-one -on -one, because I worked out, it was Charlotte Bobcats at the time. And um, uh, I sprained my ankle. And when I sprained my ankle, um, I, th I think we played three games. I think I might have won like two and lost one. You know what I mean? I sprained my ankle pretty bad. But, you know, I just wanted to, you know, keep going and stuff like that. But um, I was surprised. I didn't know how it worked. So when I didn't get um, drafted, I think it kind of shifted uh, my, my, my mindset. And, you know, it, it was hard for me back then. A lot of people take it differently. But I took it. I took it hard at the time. You know what I mean? Because it's every kid's goal to, you know, have your name um, called up on uh, you know draft night. You know. So you you then how was it playing for the Knicks in the summer league? It was, it was, it was um it was great as far as I grew up a Knicks fan in the sense of, you know that's 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 the team and the guys I looked up to in the sense of. You know, you don't know it, but those are the guys who keep you out of trouble because you fall in love with basketball and you're like, you know, I want to be like them in the sense I want to, you know, play in the league, you know, and they had a bunch of guys who I kind of favored were like Anthony Mason and Charles Oakley being a rebounder, you know, um, you know, you know, being skilled and just, you know, being like a tougher player in the sense that I'm going to get every rebound, I'm going to die for loose balls, I'm going to hedge harder screens. And I'm gonna just play and 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 figure it out. You know what I mean? Play hard. And um, you know, it was so that way. It was great, but um, it was it was tough because I played behind Channel Fry and uh, David Lee at the time. So it was like you know, like dang, like you know, you get that opportunity of a lifetime. But you know, these these guys got drafted a year before, right? And these guys um had great um great careers. I believe David Lee actually even made the All Star game. I know he averaged like twenty and ten. Channel Fry, you know, he seemed like he played in the NBA forever. And, you know, he was always a guy who started or like an eight-man rotation. And, you know, these two had great, great careers. So those were the guys that I was playing, you know, behind. So, you know, it was tough because I was so hungry to really prove myself and, you know, to prove everybody wrong. But I didn't really get a chance to. But with that being said, these are great guys I'm playing behind. I'm, I'm not going to, like, act like in practice I was killing. I had some good practices, but those guys were first-rounders for a reason. You know, those guys were, like, those, right. those guys were tough. So it, it made me better. But, um, you know, you know, you're on the bench, and you're like, man, okay, you know, I, I hope I get in the game. But I, I believe David Lee had a crazy summer league against mm -hmm. a Marley. He had, like, a 20-point, 20-and-10 20 20 game. And every game I believe he had 20-and-10. And uh, Channel Fry were like, you know, just really, you know, doing their thing. He was doing his thing too. He had a bunch of 15 and 25 point games and stuff like that, you know, playing that stretch four position. So it was like, I could barely get off the bench, but I believe I had one game against like Detroit. You know, I got like 10 minutes, I got the rock out, you know, and they, I went like four for four from the field. So I believe people knew I could play, but it was just, but, you know, especially being young, you're not that optimistic in the sense of like, and I talked to um I talked to guys about that in the sense of who in the NBA now, you know, they work with 
you know, um, you know, players and stuff like that. A lot of kids don't understand that if you don't play in summer league, it's not the end of the world. It's a marathon. When you play, you have to play good and, and play your role to the T in a sense of, you know, a lot of teams too, what they try to do is like, okay, you know what? This guy, I like him a lot out of 48 minutes. We'll, we'll play him 12 minutes or we'll play him seven minutes. What can you do in the seven minutes? Are you going to get the defensive stops? Are you going to be a game changer? Are you going to bring energy? Are you going to be a shooter in the sense of like, I can counter him and hit two big shots and stuff like that. So we, me and even a lot of the young kids now, we, uh, they, they, they don't look at it like that. And I didn't look at it like that. I'm just thinking it's the end of the world. Like, okay, I didn't get drafted. But, you know, you hear stories about guys um, signing the summer league and doing their thing and showing all out. But everybody's story is different. Right. And your time comes when your time comes. So, you know, that's what I would tell a lot of the young kids now who are playing in the summer league in a sense of you can't control if you're playing behind an a all-star, future all-star, a great player. Control what you can control. You know you're going to get in the game. When you get in the game, do what you do. And um, just, um, you know, just understand the marathon. Like, okay, the next situation that you're going to play your 30, 40 minutes, are you going to be ready to show out? Are you going to be in the right mental space? So that, that's, that's the main thing a lot of players have to understand that I didn't have back then, but even, you know, just, you know, just being on the other side of everything now, you know, uh, retiring and, you know, coaching and stuff is like, you know, that's what I can tell the kids now. And just like some of the players that they're in situations like, man, I'm better than this kid, but I don't, I'm not getting the opportunity. You're going to get your opportunity, but just be ready for it, you know? So, mm. Yeah. So you then got to play in the preseason with the Sonics. Talk yeah. about, you know, playing with Jesus Shuttlesworth. Man, um, it's something that I won't <laughs> even say I regret, right? Because, you know, back then, especially, you know, you growing up in the city is different in the sense of, like, I remember I, I heard a Fab on, like, a YouTube or, like, like, an interview, and he said he was in the elevator with Jay-Z. And he tried to act like he didn't care. <laughs> you know I mean, so even me coming over there, I was like starstruck. I believe he had, I'll never forget, he had a white Jordan, a, 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 a jump man, uh, you know, um, uh, I don't want to call it a white beater, but, um, you know, like a jersey. Yeah, whatever, tank top. Right? And, yeah, tank top, whatever. And, you know, he was Jordan out. And I'm like, he's in great shape. You look at him, he's, even to this today, he still runs and he's in phenomenal shape. But he was in tip top shape you know, about 6'5", you know, maybe 6'6", six, six on a good day. And he's, you know, smooth, smooth operator. So when I first met him, I'm like, yo, this is this is not Ray Allen. This is Jesus Shuttleworth, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it was like, wow, you know, and I, I was like, I was a little starstruck. I didn't, you know, show it at the time because, you know, you're trying to act cool, you know. This, you know, the, 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 you know, you're a young boy at the time. But I was just, you know, blown out in the sense of just what worth ethic. I remember we had a preseason game against the Lakers. And you're supposed to, I believe, the game was like, let's say like 7.30 or something like that. He was at the gym like 2.30 or something crazy because he mm -hmm. took the uh, the super, like a bus to level super early. So I guess he was probably, you know, getting a massage and, you know, just doing what he's doing, getting the shots up, relaxing. And it was a preseason game. Like, mm -hmm. it wasn't his 82-game grind. Like, like, who does that? Just somebody who's just an extremist and he's like I'm gonna be set out you know to be the best and stuff like that so I, when I looked at him like I just kind of looked and understood like wow like this is the definition of hard work and my locker was next to his so I remember he would tell me um Kenny you got to be the first one here you know you're not you don't have a contract like the rest of the guys and you know you're not on the team yet so you gotta you know show you know the, so then I remember um that's what I knew the NBA ground was different. You know, I, I don't know how much it changed, but I know back then guys were like, you know, you know, work. So I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to come two hours early. I'm going to be the first one in practice. You know, I'm going to be the first one in practice. I'm going to get a lift by myself. And then I'm going to shoot before we, uh, we have practice. Who's in the gym? Rashad Lewis. You know, a lot of people might not remember Rashad Lewis, um, but man, he had a great career um, between Seattle and Orlando. He averaged 20 a long time. He was like 6'10", you know, um, you know, cut up, you know, um, all perimeter, you know, um, had a nice three ball um, shot. And uh, he was in the weight room just lifting, you know, and I'm like, okay, this is why his body looked like that. So, you know, guys were just hard workers and 
um, you know, the best players on the team were the hardest workers. So that mm-hmm. that was kind of a, you know, blessing in the sky showing me like, because, you know, you always think that the league, oh, these guys are so good that it's going to be the guy in the end of the bench. But those were the two hardest workers on the team. You know, you guys had a, a pretty good team. Um, yeah. Nick Collison, Danny Fortson, Randy Livingston, Johan Petro, Luke Ridnour, Robert Swift, Chris Wilcox, Damian Wilkins. Wow. The list goes on and on, but I, I'll talk about the bigs who I was fighting for the positions with. Um, Nick Collison, right? I'll never forget, right, uh, the GM, Rick Son at the time, he took um, me out to dinner right before camp started, and we had a, you know, long talk, and then he was like, yeah, you know, Nick Collison, you know, he was telling me, like, you know, I know you played at Hartford, I know you did this in the pre-draft, but this is going to be different. And then you kind of, like, listen, like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But you're super confident. Like, you know, I'm going mm-hmm. to kill these dudes. I'm like, oh, Nick Collison, you're looking at stats like, oh, man, he's nobody, man. I mean, and, and not, and I, I have all the respect in the world for him, but just saying that in the sense of he's not averaging 20 and 10, you know, and just having that Superman mentality when you're young, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But when I played against him, when we started playing, because they bring you out two weeks before uh, – uh, uh, preseason starts before training camp starts and I couldn't do nothing with him he was strong as an ox he had all the moves in the world and he just had an IQ that was just crazy so even a lot of the other forwards I would outplay or even the centers the certain days I would get the best out of them but Nick Collison there's a reason he has such a long NBA career his jersey got retired um, at OKC, because you're thinking like, okay, you know what? Yeah, he's a good player. But even now, if you're watching it from the outside looking in, you're looking at it like, you know, he's a hard worker, he's a good teammate. But people don't realize how good and how skilled a guy like that was because in other teams and other situations, I guarantee you he'll be averaging 15 to 20 and 10 rebounds because he can rebound too. You know, he's an Iowa boy in the sense of just like, um, you know, playing the game the right way as far as fundamentals. So he's got to box you out every possession. He's going to, um, you know, make sure you don't get good position, going to front you in the post, going to communicate and just play the right way. So, you know, and he was even a cool dude. I, I believe he gave me a few pairs of sneakers because he had a nice Nike deal. I'm like, yo, you know, you really give me these? But he was a good dude. And then Chris Wilcox, me and him would battle. And uh, I was, I think I was too physical for him. And I would, I would get the best out of him in the beginning. But then the closer and closer it came to camp, the better and better – he started to play and you kind of noticed like, like, wow, like there's a reason why he was a top five pick out of Maryland. Like, like you're in transition and he's catching lobs in transition backwards. And, um, you know, we had some bad boys on that team, man. So it was, it was definitely a good experience. Yeah, man. Shout outs to the Sonics. Well, yeah. OKC now. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, um. After that, you went overseas to a bunch of countries. Yeah. Turkey, um, think Japan, I believe. Uh, China, China, China twice, um, Italy, Spain, um, just kind of globetrotting and stuff like that, you know, pretty much. So um, that was kind of the, the, the story, um, excuse me, the path that I chose. And I always thought, okay, I'm going to just come back and I'm going to do a training camp in the NBA. And I believe my first, like, four years, I was always I, – I always, before the season started, I would always get training camp invites and stuff like that. So I had, you know, teams that wanted me. And a lot of those contracts were, like, either not guaranteed or lower get, like, like, like lower money as far as being guaranteed. So I just kind of told myself, you know, I'm just – I'm going to keep going. I'm, I'm going to keep going overseas. I'm going to keep killing. And I know there were players at the time, especially, who played so good that the league would sign them. And my first two and a half years playing, I'll, I'll honestly say, man, like when I went to Israel, I showed out against Maccabi Tel Aviv. They were your league team back then and still one of the best teams in Europe. Every game against them, I would have um, a big game. I remember I had a – my first time I had 19 and 11 in the playoffs. We had 22 and 12, and we even beat them in, in the regular season. So my squad, we had Omi Caspi. Uh, he played for Sacramento for – uh, uh, you know, a long time, playing the NBA for 10 years. We had this guy, Trey Simmons, who kind of had a story like me in a sense of he's from Seattle, played at the University of Washington, played with Nate Robinson, Brandon Roy, Bobby Jones, all NBA players, all had like a nice career. And he was an underdog just like me. We got along good. 
because he led the team in scoring in the sense of, you know, in the, in, you know playing in the Pac, I believe Pac-12 now, but Pac-10 back then, and playing with all those dogs and all those pros and uh, Will Conroy too. So they had a bunch of NBA players and he led the team in scoring. And um, I believe he did training camp um, tooth and then just kind of, you know, chose the same path and go overseas in the sense that, you know, you know, a guy like that, he's like me, we had chips on our shoulders and, you know, you kind of want that opportunity where you're going to play 30, 40 minutes and show how good you are, which he did. He had a bunch of big games overseas and a great career, made a lot of money. And on my first, like I said, two and a half years, I did my thing against them. Jerusalem, I had like a 28, um, 28 point game against them in the regular season. Every time I played against Jerusalem or Maccabi, I always showed out. And then the next year going to Turkey, which at the time was, I believe, the best league in Europe or maybe right behind Spain, ACB, you know, they had six teams in the Euro League and Euro Cup. And I think the only other league is in the, in, like that even now is, uh, is um, I believe, Spain. And, um, you know, those teams, uh, they had Khalid al uh of the world, Will Solomon, um, so James White, um, so many good players on those teams in a sense. And those guys were going back and forth to the NBA and stuff like that. And against a lot of those bigger teams, I had a lot of similar games. Uh, like I remember we beat Fenerbahce, their EuroLeague team. We beat them in the regular season. I had a big game against them. Um, we beat uh, Turk Telecom, um, Galatesa, Galatasaray. And I had a bunch of big 20 and 10 point games against those guys. Besiktas, I had my career high. I had 30 and 15 against them. And that year, they were the best team in EuroCup. So and so it's your league and your cup, and your cup and your league. Pretty much, maybe you separate maybe five teams in your league, but other than that, it's the same thing, same competition. And they were like twelve and zero in their bracket, and um, you know they had a really good, uh, really good coach. Um, I believe he's uh, in FS Fields now, um, a big year league team out there. So it was a great opportunity. Um, so I I made sure. I, you know, people remember me. I did my thing. You know, so I had like a really good run in my career. What was the um the best thing and the worst thing about being overseas? The best thing is it makes a man out of you. I remember being in high school and I didn't even want to leave New York, and I'm like, man, I'm either gonna go to St. John's or Hofstra. Um, and it was so funny because I believe Seton Hall and Rutgers offered me a scholarship too. And I'm like, you know, you just got that city mentality, you're like, man, I'm not leaving New York. And like, you know, I remember going to Seton Hall like years. I'm like, man, it's right there. It's 30 minutes outside of outside of the city and stuff like that. So um, it, it, it makes a man out of you in the sense of, you know, when you go into these new situations, you're adapting, you know, um, you know you got to perform and, um, you know, you're experiencing the world in the sense of, you know, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're opening your eyes to just, you know, different experiences and just, you know, um, and actually some of the best times of my life. And the hardest thing is just being away from, from familiarity in the sense of your family, your friends, the food you know. Um, you know, if you have a girlfriend at the time, just being away from, you know, you know your loved ones, you know what I mean? So um, it wasn't always easy, but it was just something I, I had to do to, um, uh, you know, I guess get to, the next, get to this next stage of my life, uh, you know, with just, being, uh, you know, with maturity and, you know, wisdom. And I, I believe, like, my story, you know, helped me a lot. And it's going to help me um, um, with this part of my career in the sense of coaching because uh, of my past experiences and just being able to relate to um, players and, you know, kids and stuff like that, you know, especially the ones who have trials along the way, you know. Indeed. So, you know, now that you're no longer playing, um. Talk about, you know, your player development program. Well, um, I was lucky enough to get with uh, Jay David uh, last summer and uh, coach um, um, and learn from him um, with the, you know, New York Jayhawks. And, um, man, we went to L.A., Dallas, uh, Alabama, so many places, and there was, you know, so much talent on the team. So, um you know, uh, with some of those players over there, uh, Jared Garcia, who's a UNC Charlotte, you know, Zed Key, um, I would, um, you know, get to, you know, be able to, you know, work them out. And, you know, even if I didn't uh, the way I wanted to, just give them just like 
certain, um, you know, uh, just give them certain pointers in the sense of just making the game easy, in the sense of just position, protecting the ball, um, you know, making one move and just going to the basket, just trying to help them with their IQ. And, you know, they both had great, great seasons. And um, it was 15 players. All kids went Division One schools. And most importantly, they all had great GPAs, great kids, 3.5 GPAs. Uh, some of them are going to um, Ivy League. Uh, Liam Murphy's going to Columbia. Um, you know, so it's just a bunch of really good kids. And some of the funniest kids in the uh, world, uh, Asa, uh, B.I., he's going to um, Canisius. The, what, to me, one of the best defensive players I ever saw. And I've been in this game 30 years and stuff like that. So we just had a bunch of kids who were like, you know, you know, uh, you know, good at certain things in the sense of, um, you know, whether we had a kid named uh, Ben, um, uh, he's going to Tulane. Like he could not miss in, um, in, 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 in Alabama and LA. And he, we played against, uh, there's a kid going to North Carolina, um, a big, uh, you know, big white kid, you know. Walker Kessler? Skilled. Yeah, super McDonald's All-American, super skilled, great player. And I, I remember Ben had a crazy game against him. He had like seven threes, throwing up signs. And just like we had so many good players. And just, you know, for me now uh, with player development, you know, as, as, as a coach, you get lucky because, man, you're around so much talent. And then it's, it's easy in a sense like, oh, man, like, you know, because these kids are already talented when, um, you know, when, when you have them. But you just help take them to another, you know, level in the sense of, you know, just, you know, level it's like, the, you know, cherry on, um, on, on, on the cake and stuff like that. So just, you just add them more to the land in the sense of just, you know, hey, you know, um, you do this defensively or just make sure, you, you know, you protect the ball or make sure you, you know, use your body and, you know, get them up one time with head fake. Just the littlest things in the world, you know, um, could, it, it just takes their game to a whole nother level because, like I said, they had coaches, they had um, um, trainers or play development coaches before and the thing about it is just like you know those guys did a great job because they obviously very good players but you want to tell them from a very good player to a great player and I believe um, that's what I'm trying to do now so um, talk about um, oh yeah this is a question that I love to ask my guests um, before I lead up to the final question so if you could go back to 2006 what would you tell a younger Kenny Adelecki at 25? Just listen to the GM and just, you know, just do the G League. Because <laughs> more than likely they would have called you up. In the sense of what I did back then, I was a rebounder. And um, I believe I was so competitive in the sense of wanting to be the best rebounder. I remember playing against like a Paul Millsap and he let Kyle rebound the three three uh three years in a row and then even in a workout to so try and get a, a rebound over him you know a lot of times you know when you're good at one thing whether it's you know you're a great shooter you're a great defender the league always rewards you and stuff like that so you know just i would tell him just be a little patient because a patient man is a successful man you know that's a great quote right there yeah. um final question what's next in the future for kenny adeleke um I'm just kind of networking now and seeing what's um, going to happen in the sense of, you know, um, and, I, and I'm blessed in the sense of from every level to high school, college, MBA, I'm talking on a daily basis to um, um, college coaches, MBA, MBA coaches, MBA guys, um, uh, high school, um, at the high school level, Joe Loads. He taught me how to drive in college, right? The Cardinal Hayes coach. <laughs> so it was funny because when I connected with him, I said, Joe, I didn't even know you were coaching Cardinal Hayes. And I think he thought, like, you know, because, you know, he probably thought I was like, come on, you knew I was a Cardinal Hayes. I'm like, no. Like, the whole game and the, the way everything is just changed the last 20 um, years in the sense of just, like, when I was a senior high school, Cardinal Hayes wasn't. But I remember before that they had, you know, Jamal Mashburn when I was a little kid. So just, you know, figuring it out and just being blessed enough to have players who give me opportunity. Um, like, I know besides the Jayhawks, and I told you about, um, you know, a few bigs, but uh, the Josh Gray and, of course, my, uh, my, my, my little bro, um, Abu Uzman, those two, uh, they're going to LSU and North Texas, respectively. And uh, those guys um, I did a lot of player development with. And like I said, you know, they had great coaches before them, and they got to that point. But 
just being, um, you know, what's in the future for me is just being lucky enough to coach great players and just help take their game to the next level, which um, I felt like I did with, with, with a lot of these guys that I work with and just adding on to the land. So whatever level it is, it's just I'm going to be the best version of myself. And I think I'm enjoying retirement in the sense of I know um, coaching professionally and coaching college, those jobs are very, very demanding. But um, I think I worked my butt off 12 years I played, you know, and, um, you know, it's just something that I think that even uh, I had an opportunity, uh, one of my friends, Royal Lively, he gave me a chance to work out for the Knicks. Uh, right before I retired, I was like 35. And, you know, I'm like, man, I hope they can even get me in the G League team. But, man, it was the uh, guys, Mitchell Robinson, Noah Vonley. Those guys are young lions. So even if you have a good yeah. day and you think you just play as good or play better, all right, now you got to practice the next day. And you're 35, you're feeling sore, and these right. guys are running for days and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, even with Noah, I, 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 work, I help work with him a little. And a lot of times, sometimes it's hands-on, and sometimes it's just pointers in the sense of just drilling that in their head in the sense of, like, I saw a guy, I'm like, yo, man, you're like, you're like a new age Carl Malone. And uh, I, his contract wasn't fully guaranteed, and I was just rooting for him the whole time. And, you know, whatever I could help him with the, at the time, I felt like I did. And, you know, he's doing his thing. He's on the Nuggets now. And, um, you know, he was a step out the league. And to see what he did that season with the Knicks, to see what he did with Minnesota, and even, you know, um, I think I saw something on um, IG or NBA.com and, you know, practice just, you know, showing him, you know, doing his thing. You know, that's that's big for me. So just being in a blessed situation, able to coach on good teams and coach good players that I can just help turn them, you know, you know, t take the game to the next level, you know? Well, Kenny, thank you for coming on to share your testimony. And I wish you nothing but the best moving forward. I appreciate it. And, you know, we, we got to hit it off when we really talked, um, I believe, after the uh, Long Island Lutheran game. And, you know, I'm, I'm rooting for you, man. There's not too many dudes like you in the sense of genuine. And, I mean, you just keep doing what you're doing. I know your day's coming. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a big supporter. You know what I mean? My God. Well, yes. everybody, this is episode 56 of Hoops Talk with Dave's Drink. You know, shout-outs to everybody out there. Um, for those of you guys from Crown Heights and everybody that supports Kenny, check this episode out on YouTube, Facebook, and IGTV. Okay. I, I'm sorry to cut you off. And I got a shout-out, South Jamaica, Queens. <laughs> I spent a lot of my childhood over there. And, you know, I got to show love to 72, junior high school, 72. And I is safe because that's where, like, also I took my game to another level, you know? Yeah, so everybody from Queens also definitely check out this, um, this um, episode on Facebook, YouTube, and IGTV. But everybody stay safe and stay blessed. Peace. Peace.